and welcome everyone to Selvage. I'm Polly Leonard, the founder and editor of Selvage magazine. Tea and Textile Talks. It's a fortnightly chat. We have part of our there is Molly already. Hi. Hello, was that too uh, was that too prompt, Polly? No, not at all. Not at all. I was just <laughs> telling um, our readers who are listening that this is a chat that's part of our winter of making. We're doing these once every two weeks on a Friday afternoon. Um, and this week I have the great pleasure to uh, be talking to Molly Mohan, who has both appeared in the pages of our current issue and is inspiring us all at the moment with her wonderful uh, block printed textiles. I first was introduced to Molly by Angel Hughes of Tobias and the Angel, she told me she had taught you how to block print and that I should look out for you because you were going to do wonderful things. And to write she was, she has an amazing place down in Surrey where she teaches lots of people block printing. Uh, and then I think the first time we met Molly was when you exhibited at one of our early salvage fairs. Um, yep. Uh, down at Chelsea Town Hall. They were just charming, lovely fairs. Um, so, first question. I know you didn't go through the usual art school training, which I think makes your story even more inspiring. Can you tell me a little bit about your influences and particularly how Charleston Farmhouse fits into your, your aesthetic and your vision? Yes, I can. Yes, all of that. I think um, the tra going back to the training bit, um, you're right. I didn't study art as a GCSE or an A-level, but I was always very creative and I was always interested in doing creative things. Um, my mum on a Saturday would always be doing something artistic like marbling or book binding. And so it was very inherent in me to be creative. And so I think I've always had that um, you know, as I've gone through life and I've always used it as something to kind of go back to or to find, to counterbalance work. I, I used to have a very kind of high energy job in London and then going and doing creative things, I found very calming and peaceful. So that was how I kind of got into making things. But um, really, as you said, Angel was my first sort of teacher. I did a sort of a mini apprenticeship with her. And I did that because I'd been on one of her workshops and just fallen head over heels in love with block printing. So I found that block printing was my real creative outlet. I found that it was the one medium that just totally gave me a massive buzz. And that was the beginning of my kind of block printing journey. Um, and in terms of Charleston, that, that came into my life when we moved out of London and came down here to Sussex. Charleston's 20 minutes down the road from here, so really accessible for me. Nestled in the Downs, it's the most lovely location. So even just arriving at Charleston is a sort of exciting thing. Lovely Georgian house. And it has inspired, um, it's actually inspired the way I decorate my own home as well as my pattern making. And I think the main thing that I get out of Charleston is how... Uh, Vanessa and Duncan and all of the Bloomsbury group went around with this sort of liberating confidence just to decorate the house as they felt fit. So they have painted fireplaces, doorways, cupboards, they've made carpets, they've made lampshades out of unusual things. You know, they've really kind of used what they've got around them and used their creative skills to make their home very personal to them. And I have, I find that terribly kind of inspiring. And it's, it's enabled me to go about decorating my home in the same way as well. And so, yeah, it's a lovely, it's a lovely place. It's also full of colour. I mean, you must have been there, Polly. You, yeah, you yeah. would know all those amazing yeah. colours. I'm just going to, just for anyone who's just joined us, I'm Polly Lambert, the founder and editor of Salvage Magazine. You're listening to Tea and Textiles. And I'm talking to Molly Mahon. And we're talking about Charleston Farmhouse. Charleston was the wartime home of the artists uh, within the Bloomsbury group. Uh, they, after the war, they stayed on, I think Duncan Grant stayed there until he died in the 70s. I might not be right about that. If um, Molly has inspired you, uh, we have featured her beautiful Charleston inspired home in issue 97 of Salvage, that's the current issue. And if, um, that's not enough. 
Molly Mahon for you. Molly has very kindly given us a uh, hundred of her beautifully printed tea towels uh, as a reader's offer. So if you're tempted to subscribe to Selvage, please do. And we will send you some of Molly's beautiful, cheerful tea towels to brighten up your kitchen. Now, mm -hmm. that's not where your relationship with Charleston ends, Molly. You raised lots of money for them during the pandemic, which is a wonderful thing. Do you want to tell us a little bit about potato printing and how you've helped Charleston survive having a whole season with uh, no income? Yeah, yeah. Yes. So again, uh, it was almost, gosh, it's nearly been a year, hasn't it? So when I had to, because I hold uh, block printing workshops at Charleston and we had to cancel our lovely spring schedule that we had this time last year or March and April time. And it was so devastating. We kept getting these messages from people saying how disappointed they were that we couldn't hold the workshops. And that was what sort of fueled me to start potato printing on Instagram. And I really just wanted to offer some way of saying, no, you can't come on my workshop, but you can still have a go at doing this. And obviously, um, I have the most amazing spoiling amount of wooden um, block prints that I've collected and had made in India. But not everyone was going to have access to those, certainly not to my collection. So that was what made me think that we can use a potato. Again, I kind of went back to sort of what I did as a child. And I just did a few classes for fun on Instagram. And actually, it was so lovely. They were just such a hit because it's so accessible. It's such an accessible form of creating pattern and print you know most of us have got a potato in the back of the fridge and we can all get some kind of um, paint out of our cupboards so that was the beginning of the potato printing thing that became a lovely movement for a short while and then um you know again so there was so much devastation with so many things going on and i just thought what in my small local way could i do something to help and so we came up with the idea of the great potato print society and we asked people who were um, patrons of Charleston or local or, you know, also uh, wanted to do something, whether they would donate a potato print that they had done. And again, I thought everyone was going to laugh me off the sofa, you know, when I suggested this idea. But honestly, nearly everybody from Kit Camp to, to um, everybody I can think of, Nisha Crosland, said yes. And we got the most amazing collection of potato prints that we auctioned and raised some money to help Charleston um, survive through these tricky times. So it was just really fun, but also, you know, useful and helpful for Charleston. Wonderful. Thank you, Molly. Potato printing has, of course, been hugely influential in my own life, as well as in that of Selvage magazine. Um, I read a book many, many years ago when I was training to be an art teacher called Investigating Art by Moy Keatley. Now, Moy Keatley was an art teacher at North London Collegiate School. She was assistant to Peggy Angus, who, interestingly, I think lived down um, in Surrey, somewhere near you, Molly. She, also... she lived very, very near Charleston. She lived very near Charleston. I don't know if she knew if there was some connection. I mean, maybe, maybe there was. I think they crossed over slightly with the sort of Omega workshops, but yes, yes. I don't think they sort of socialised, funnily enough, in Sussex so much. I think they were very separate sort of entities. Mm. Uh, she was a very interesting woman, um, Peggy Angus. She taught at North London Collegiate School from just after the war until the 1970s, and not only inspired me to become an art teacher originally, but inspired me to send my daughter to... North London Collegiate. She has now just graduated, gone off to university, although oddly enough during the pandemic is still back at home with me. If you have now uh, got the bulk, the Charleston bulk, our current issue, so this issue isn't out yet, this is issue 99, this comes out on the 15th of February. We've got a couple of uh, articles about Charleston and its legacy and this issue has inspired us to put together one of our um, monthly talks. Uh, this is going to be in May, I think on the 12th of May, and Darren uh, Clark, the curator of Charleston, is going to give us a lecture about the Bloomsbury Group and their legacy. And Molly has very kindly agreed to give us a presentation with images of her work. Um, and also Annie Sloan, who has been inspired by Charleston, I'm sure those of you who are listening in the UK will know of Annie's work, but maybe further afield, she is a producer of Chalk Paint, which is a 
has a very interesting surface and can be used to decorate your home in the style of Charleston. So we can't talk about your work, um, Molly, without talking about India. Not only do you have your prints uh, printed in Jaipur, but there's certainly, I can see an influence in your aesthetic and color sense that comes from that, that culture. Can you tell us a little bit about your first trip to India and what it's like working with the artisans you've met there? Yes. Um, so that's been another sort of more recent chapter, actually, my India story. Um, I went there for the first time about six years ago, and I really thought it was going to be a one-off trip because having learned to block print um, in the UK, but knowing that um, Jaipur is the home of block printing and that there are so many incredibly skilled artisans there, I was longing to go. So I did eventually arrange one, what, what felt like such a daring trip. I had three small children, um, so leaving them behind. But I just was so um, desperate to kind of absorb how they were doing it and how it all went. And so I took myself off to Jaipur and, um, well, it's been a sort of, I don't know what it was. It was a bit like falling in love all over again. I just thought I'd go do one trip, come home, have picked up some information, but I fell head over heels in love. I mean, I had, it I've read about there. India <laughs> I, and I've looked at images before, but it is not the same as being there. And it was just the moment I arrived in this sort of cacophony of color and noise and vibrancy. And also actually it's just the passion the passion that they have for their crafts there is quite staggering. And I hear I found myself surrounded by all these block printers and we could all share something together, even though, you know, we had such different backgrounds. And so I made lots of friends very quickly and I was blown away by how they create all sorts of different crafts, but particularly the block printing. And so I actually found myself um, collaborating with some of the artisans who now print our lengths of fabric, which is brilliant because I wouldn't be able to do it all by myself anymore. Um, and so it's been a wonderful, wonderful thing. And I think I just feel that again, it's really helped me grow in confidence, one with everything that I've learned from there, but also the lovely colors they use and their sunny kind of outlook on life. They're terribly positive. And um, they say that if you like something, you just have to go for it. And so I brought that into decorating my home and which colors I apply to my fabrics and things like that. So it's been a very positive experience. I think uh, I really see that blend of English country garden and Jaipur in your work, which is, which is extraordinary. If you would like to learn more about block printing, we have a special block printing lecture evening this Wednesday coming up. That's the 10th of February. We have um, Barley uh, Roskell, who is a craft historian. She's going to be talking to us about Baron and Larcher, who are English or were English block printers from the 1930s. Uh, we have um, Daraj Chipper, who is actually a block printer from Bagru, just outside Jaipur. And uh, Lily and Hope Stockman, who are from Block Shop which is a California-based design company who have taken block printing in a very different direction. Their work is almost minimal. It's almost, it has some, um, I think, Bauhaus influences. And they just, it's just very interesting to see lots of different approaches. Could you tell me, um, Molly, a little bit about your new collection, which I think is, I can really see that the development of your work, and this is almost the pinnacle to date. Yeah. I think it's beautiful. Oh, thank you. Oh, thank you. And I think you're so right. I think, um, so it's my third um, fabric collection and it's called Greencomb and it's exactly that. It's bringing much more sort of bold flowers and lovely fresh colours as well as keeping some of the brighter colours that I like. Uh, um, it's a slightly more sophisticated colour palette, but still got those touches of joyful brightness to them. And yeah, we've pulled lovely influences from India and from the English garden. And so there's a whole mixture of sort of little um, tweed style patterns to elephants walking along to big, big blousy um, dianthus flowers and primroses and things like that. So we are so excited about launching this. It's, um, it's going to be launched on the 22nd of February. So yeah, and it's been about been about two years in the making so it's a long time from when I sort of yes. set out 
to when I actually could get it out into the world. So I'm counting down the days. I, for me, it's the florals. I completely love them. I think they're just beautiful. I have a funny little story to share with our, our listeners. We have very sadly recently lost our blog editor, Kate. She has moved on to greener pastures. And we have applied for, uh, or advertised for a new blog manager. And we had over 100 applicants. So how, how do you choose between all of those applicants? So we set a task to write a blog post about Molly's new collection. So we have, in the salvage office, we have read, you know, 80 or 90 oh. blog posts about a new collection. So we know all about it. We just love it. We oh. think that, and we think you photographed it so beautifully. Oh. The, the images are stunning. Um, can I just ask you one difficult thing about block printing? Uh, how do you, Molly, communicate to your customers that they may not get a perfect print, that every print has its own personality? You can see the hand of the maker. And some people who perhaps aren't particularly familiar with block printing may see that as a mistake or something that's not quite perfect. Yes, that's such a good question because it's something that we've really had to... Um sort of understand ourselves because exactly that what with block printing we call it perfect imperfections every yeah. single element is printed with a very small almost at a 20 by 20 centimeter wooden block and for every different color involved is a different block that's been carved to fit within the one before so you are talking of lifting and placing endless wooden blocks with with the paint on it up and down up and down in this amazing rhythm and therefore it will never be what we know as machine perfect. And for me, that's why I choose block printing. I love those imperfections. That's what gives the fabric its energy and its vibrancy. Um, that's how it tells the story. Um, there's so much more to it. I mean, it's almost a piece of art in itself. And that's why I choose block printing. I always say we could probably produce um, on a machine, we could probably produce what we produce block print in a year in a week on a machine you know <laughs> why don't I do that because I find that some machine printed it just hasn't got that story and that energy but going back more importantly to your question it is something we have to kind of educate sounds a bit wrong but we have to tell the story we want people to understand that we've chosen this sort of ancient craft and that we're really passionate about it and that there will be marks and blemishes along the way. I mean, very occasionally, the printer might put the block upside down. But to me, that's just, in a way, wonderful. Lucky you if you get that part. And, and it can be difficult. We, we have had clients who have rung and said, this has got a mark here or a gap here. And we just explain the process to them. And I think as long as we keep telling the story and keep now with Instagram and things, we can be so visual. We can show videos of the printing. You know, we can really help explain what makes it so beautiful, people start to kind of get it and then also rejoice in it and understand and want to have it. So I think it's an ongoing thing. What's so lovely is there seems to be this real return to block printing and handcrafted items. So I feel that actually the pressure is off to constantly explain the method behind the process that uh, when I started to block print, no one knew what block printing was. It was sort of dying out, but there's an amazing resurgence going on. So um, hopefully that kind of makes it more accessible to people and um, they, they understand the importance think, of it. I think you're absolutely right, Molly, about there being a real, uh, possibly um, one of the good things that might come out of the pandemic, that we've all perhaps stared at our screens too long and there's a real interest in something that's more human, something mm. that's more generous and kinder and Block printing perhaps sums up that, that atmosphere that uh, we hope will go forward with us after the, the pandemic. Mm. Well, thank you very much, Molly. Our time has come to an end. Uh, it's been super talking to you, and thank you all very much for joining us. Our next Tea and Textile Talk will be actually next Friday at this time, when I'll be talking to Marcella Echevarria from Colombia about various projects she is involved in. Have a lovely weekend and thank you all again very much for joining me and thank you, Molly. It's been Thanks, Polly. No, not at all. So lovely. Thanks. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.